morning, ladies and gentlemen. If everybody could please find your way to your seats. So, just like yesterday, I asked you to take your seats, but I'm going to ask you to stand and, and uh, we'll start our AFCIA day like we always start AFCIA functions with our Pledge of Allegiance. So please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Please take your seats and welcome. Welcome to day two of our symposium. Hope everybody had a great day yesterday and uh, enjoyed the Broadmoor or Colorado Springs area last evening. And glad to see you all made it back safely as well. Uh, yesterday, our focus was on policy and some of the issues surrounding policy, good and bad. Today, we're going to focus on partnerships. How can we make our partnerships better between industry, government, government to industry, industry to government? So hope everybody enjoys our panels and our speakers. It's going to be a busy day again, so we're going to go ahead and get started. But before we do, I would like to talk a little bit about the classified session. So there was a lot of back and forth, 650 some odd people. Uh, I had to get that down to 195 because that's how many seats I have in the facility per fire code. And what we're trying to do now is match those 195 people, the clearances, and either a map or a bus pass. We have buses to get you out there if you don't have a vehicle, but I need to know because right now I'm paying for two buses for 10 people. I don't want to pay for two buses for 10 people. I would rather pay for one bus for 10 people and give the other money back to our scholarship fund. So by 10 o'clock today, I have to make that decision on whether I'm going to cancel that bus. Please, 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 if you're signed up for the classified session, you know who you are because I've sent you emails for the last, over the last few weeks. Please go to the front desk. It says DV classified session. Please just talk to my uh, volunteers out there that are helping me out, track who's doing what, and they'll take care of you. If everybody wants to take a bus, we'll have a problem there too. But so far, the majority have said uh, they, they'll just drive their own vehicles. Please help me out there. Um, there are a few people still canceling out, so I'm trying to get through the, uh, the standby list, if you will, to make sure that we fill all of those seats. Okay. For some more admin comments, I'd like to introduce the chairman of this year's symposium, Mr. Chris Beasley. Good morning. See, we still have folks making their way in. Come on in, folks. First off, I'd like to welcome you to day two of the 2015 Cyberspace Symposium. We hope you had a really great first day for those of you that were here. We had a super opening session by Dr. Mark Weatherford. We had a very interesting luncheon speech by General Hawkins. Uh, and we had two interesting afternoon panels, one led by Dr. Myros and the other by Brigadier General Wooten. So we really hope you enjoyed the first day. We capped that then with some really good socializing in the exhibit hall and a lot of good food provided by the Broadmoor. And then we had our Wounded Warrior benefit in the, in the rest of the, for the rest of the evening. And we appreciate all the folks that went to that. Uh, we raised some, some good money. We won't know for sure for a couple days exactly how much we raised, but a significant amount of money that will go towards the Mount Carmel uh, Wounded Warrior Foundation and the Air Force Wounded Airmen Program. Today's session will be equally interesting, and it will be just as fun. So we're going to start off this morning by something that'll make you think, a presentation by retired Lieutenant General Bob Allardyce. He's going to challenge you with some concepts that you really want to think about. Uh, we're going to follow that then by uh, an industry panel that has always been a big hit here, led by Lieutenant General Harry Radege. That will take place in the mid-morning. And then we have General John Hyten, the commander of Air Force Base Command, who will be providing our lunch remarks. And that will also be really good. In the afternoon, we have a panel moderated by 
uh, Brigadier General retired and now Deputy Assistant Secretary Greg Tuhill. And then finally, our, our final speaker of the day, who will also challenge you with some interesting things, Lieutenant General Bill Bender, the Air Force A6. So another great day. The exhibit hall will be open all day and will stay open for an hour after General Bender is done. So lots of time to go meet our vendors and to socialize, to get some good information. And we really look forward to a great second day. I have a couple of reminders. First off, uh, we do have a presence on, on social media. So if you'd like to go on Facebook, we are the Cyberspace Symposium. Pretty easy to find us. Just put in Cyberspace Symposium and like us. Well, you don't have to like me, but please like the page. We have a Twitter handle. It's at AFSIA underscore symposium. So please go on Twitter. We've got uh, Twitter things, tweets that we're pushing out about the speakers and so forth. We also have our mobile app, and we have uh, over 300 people that have already downloaded that. We have an iPhone, Windows phone, and an Android version. So please go on those various stores and download our app. The app has all the bios, the program, the surveys, everything you need to know about the conference. And we're trying to encourage you to use that app for a couple of reasons. One, because it's got the most current information. Uh, secondly, we are a technology a business and we need to, to push forward our good technology. And then lastly, uh, we are trying to cut costs in the future and save trees. So next year, uh, we will probably not print a full program. We will probably ask you to use the mobile app next year and just have a pocket agenda. So please get used to the app. To make you want to enjoy it, we will be giving away later this afternoon an iPad Mini 3. So when you open the app, right on the front page, there's a contest button. Go in there, hit, I want to take part in the contest. And this afternoon on our, our afternoon break, we will be announcing a winner of this little gem right here. We also have 15 lunches left. So if you haven't bought a lunch yet, you can go up to the registration desk and get a lunch. We have lots of t-shirts left. It's a great looking t-shirt. Please go to the AFSIA booth right outside the door there. So you got a nice little chapter logo and then on the back, the symposium. Our sponsors, General Dynamics and uh, Battelle have paid for a t-shirt, so please go grab them. We have lots of sizes. Um, lastly, one very quick announcement. Uh, Matt Gancy, you don't have your CAT card, we do. So please go to security and uh, we'll provide you back your CAT card. So Matt Gancy, we have your CAT card. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Cadet Second Class, Josh Hayden, who will introduce General Allardyce. Thank you and have a great day, everyone. Good morning. I am Cadet Second Class Josh Hayden from Cadet Squadron 16. I'm a CNS major, uh, Computer and Network Security. Um, I am also on the Cadet Cyber Team, and I'm here to introduce uh, Lieutenant General Retired Bob Allardyce. Uh, General Allardyce um, commanded the numbered Air Force Joint Wing Squadron. Um, uh, he commanded a number of joint assignments. Um, in the last four years, he ran Global Air Mobility Enterprise um, and now heads an entrepreneurial consulting firm as well as serves as a senior um, fellow to National Defense University. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Lieutenant General Retired Bob Allardyce. Put that right there, Watch the arrows. Well, good morning. Thank you, Josh, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, it's really neat to see uh, the cadets uh, that uh, volunteered to miss class. Uh, to do things like introduce us, and so we really appreciate their their contribution. Of course, when I was a cadet way back in the day, uh, I wouldn't dare miss a class because I was too stupid uh, to uh, to make up the time. I, I just, I, I couldn't, I'm serious, I couldn't do it. So uh, you really have a lot of my respect. I want you to know I aspire to be a cyber warrior, but but I'm really not. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I just don't have the tools. Uh, in fact, when we were going through the bio, Joshua said, he went through the whole thing and he said, uh, sorry to dime me out, but he said, so what's this got to do with cyber? <laughs> and I said, nothing. Um, except I'm, I'm a joint warfighter. I was, I am, you know, I took it to the fight. I understand the global enterprise. 
Uh, I'm, I'm a mentor to uh, the Joint Warfighter today and, and just got back from a real fun session with the, the latest uh, key uh, capstone class, the brand new general officers, uh, some of whom you all would know, uh, just this last weekend. I, I really want to thank you all for having me here today. It's kind of neat to be uh, invited to this. It's, in fact, it's a real honor. Uh, and it's a, a privilege to be able to talk about uh, what we call, uh, and you'll see the slides here in a few minutes, uh, the digital age paradox. But it's hard for me to see you here, but I, I want to get a little bit of audience, um, just appreciation for who's in the audience. So we're going to do this generationally, if that's okay. So uh, how many of you consider yourself baby boomers? Not, don't get up. I don't want you to get up because I don't want you to break your joints. But <laughs> baby boomers, put your hands up, please. Wow, a lot of old people here. Okay, um, what about millennials? How many millennials? Uh, you can stand up, if you would, please. Uh, millennials, any millennials? Any people who testify to be millennials? Oh, that's surprising. That's interesting. Okay, okay how about uh, Gen Zers? Yeah, yeah, th those about 19 and younger. And, oh yeah, I forgot Gen X, but you guys always get forgotten, right? Uh, uh, yeah, you latchkey kids, MTV. Don't blame me, I read it on the internet. How many are Gen Xers in this crowd? Okay, so frankly, about 50-50 from the old people and the middle-aged people. Uh, so that's good to know. Well, let me, um, let me start off first. You can bring the first slide up, please, the lead slide. And, and we call this presentation the digital age paradox. Now, I'm gonna talk about digital age. Some people say information age, some say digital age. I'm gonna talk about digital age because in the joint war fight, and for you all, information age doesn't do it, okay? People talk about the information environment and unfortunately, it's real easy to kick the information over to the public affairs people or the comm dudes. And this is not a comm problem and it's not a public affairs problem, it is a digital age warfighter problem set that we're dealing with. So we talk about the digital age, and I may slip every now and then say information, but this is the, it's the digital age. And the question I want you to start with, and what I hope to do here is make you think. At the end, I hope you're a little bit agitated. I hope you'll want to argue, but mostly I just want you to think. And the question I want to start with is cyber, defense, who owns this problem? Write it down, think about it. Who owns this problem? We're gonna talk about that, but, but to start off, I, I need to kind of set the stage, and so I, I'm gonna talk about the environment and the strategic environment and what it means to us, but before I get to that, I need to kind of go back in history and talk about some lessons from the ancients and what we might draw from that, and so uh, to do that, I, I need to ask a broad question. I need to see if I can see you answer this. How many of you are familiar with um, a famous philosopher's name was uh, Monty Python? Anybody out there, you know Monty Python? Good, okay, so you may get this. I, I asked Joshua to hang around to help me with this. So um, in the, uh, about the 1200 time frame, mid ages, the king of the battlefield, the king of the battlefield was the armored knight, usually mounted. Europe had this. They invested a lot of money in that weapon system. They polished that weapon system. The rich people ran that weapon system. They dominated the battlefield with that weapon system. And you'll recall these scenes from Monty Python. Help me out here, Joshua. The mounted armored knight. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, sir. Give me a hand. I was about ready to say next slide, I forgot, that's me. You know, you retire, you don't have age, you don't have drivers, you gotta do all this stuff yourself. All right. Lessons from the ancients. 1224, the European mountain knight, we are armored knight, we already talked about. Okay, so there's the Europeans and, and, and a new phenomenon was sweeping across Asia. Next visual aid. This guy by the name of Genghis Khan, who started very poor, he's basically a bastard child, he had nothing, and just by the time he was about 20, he started growing his force, 
And in 1224, three years before he died in his 60s, he had created one of the greatest empires of all time. He swept across uh, Northern Asia, and now in 1224, three years before his death, he was bumping it up and he came up against the Europeans for the first time. The Mongols were indestructible. They used new weapons, composite bows, new tactics, little ponies ran real fast, lots of them, and in Incredible uh, combination of understanding of the strategic environment and tactics wiped out everything in their place and restructured that part of the world. The Europeans in 1224, the Europeans in this case, Eastern Europeans, the, the uh, Russians, if you want to uh, look at it, were, were the first ones to come up against them and got, we'll talk about it in a minute, got wiped out. And it happened again in 1247. But the Europeans came out, outnumbered the Mongols three to one, about 60,000 people going against 20,000 Mongols, and they got crushed. What happened? It happened, by the way, in 1224. I said it happened again in 1247, but the Europeans, they're smart. They learned their lessons, right? So let's look at another thing here. In 1346, Cresset, France, the English came across the channel. The English... Uh, had several forces, but on this particular day in Cresset in 1346, uh, there was 1,500 new bow, not the small composite, but this thing called a long bow. It had only been around for about 100 years. New invention. The French came out. You got it once again. Armored knight galloped up to the battlefield, 4,500 French knights, 1,500 longbowmen used terrain tactics and the longbow range and wiped out the French. What happened? How did the Europeans who spent so much money had the most advanced society in their eyes at the time, uh, were clearly smarter than the Mongols and the French were clearly better than the, than the English. How'd they get killed? How'd they get wiped out? You see, victory doesn't go with the people with the biggest weapon systems and the people that spend the most, you know this, and you know what I'm implying. Victory goes to those who comprehend the strategic environment, one, and then apply the weapons at their disposal in a manner that destroys the enemy's will, is what I'd say. You don't have to kill them all, but you gotta destroy their will. We should know this, right? We should be thinking this way, right? So, this starts with understanding the strategic environment. I'm going to talk about that uh, quite a little bit today. And just, just to make sure that, that you're still with me every now and then, you'll hear me knock the coconuts. If you laugh or go winning like a horse or something like that, I'll know you're with me, okay? Hey, so let's talk about strategic environment, but I want to start with some words. And way, way in the back, wait, uh, let's see, guy just drank the coffee, yeah, right there, are you. Can you read these words? Can you read these? Yeah, okay, okay good. You're my, you're my kind of anchor point, so it's hard to maintain eye contact, but, but if you can't read or if your lips, once your lips stop moving, let me know and I'll move on, okay? Thank you. Um, how many of you are familiar with these words? Anybody? Yeah, you ought to be. Because your organizations, your organizations have some kind of digital divide that they're producing and they're part of. Your organizations better care about organizational ambidexterity, your capacity to execute the mission or the job today and prepare for the mission tomorrow. And the refresh gap, this is my favorite, the refresh gap, your, particularly in this business, your people, your soldiers, your sailors, your airmen, the refresh gap, the frustration they feel when they walk through the gate and dumb themselves down versus how they perform in their personal lives is having an impact on you and you may not even know it. We're gonna talk about this. So remember these words, kind of cage them, we're gonna come back to them later. Let's talk about, we talked about strategic environment, said how important that was. So let's talk about our strategic environment right now from a global perspective, and then I'll kind of get into what, what, how that affects uh, those of us in the defense business. Here's a snapshot, I took this from uh, We Are Social, give credit where credit is due. Uh, at the end of 2014, it hadn't changed much since then. But here's just a, a global digital snapshot of where we are. Just check out these numbers. 7.2 billion people in the world. This is a fun G-Wiz. You can go look at this on the internet. Uh, they update it regularly. But look at how many people are connected in this world. Look how many people are connected 
with smartphones. What does that mean? More important, check this out. 10 years ago. Wow. You know, 13.5 years ago, we got nailed on 9-11 and we went to war, right? Airmen would argue we were at war for 20 years before that. But let's just say in 2001, we started war. We've been at war, our warriors have, for 13.5 years. Since that time, and, and I'm very serious about this, while well, we've been focused on this war, the world has changed. I think you know that in the, this business. But I, I just want to be really clear, and I, again, I'm a very current knowledge and perspective on this, it's mine, but listen carefully. The joint warfighter doesn't get this problem set. They want to get this problem set, but they don't understand this problem set of the digital battle. Here's a couple more slides just for the, this, on this one, I really think this is cool. In the middle, if you can read, it's hard to, but Google Plus, kind of the top third, it says 343 million people. Google Plus, it's a, that's kind of your anchor point. That's the population-ish of the United States. There's 1.4-ish billion people who are using Facebook every single day. We talk about that, but, but the purpose here to bring this up is, what does that mean when we talk about cyber defense? What, what is happening to my strategic environment? One last one, I just throw this up for giggles uh, because I, I don't know what this means. This really, you know, how many people, it's, and the numbers aren't as staggering, but these are people who have point-to-point -point contact anywhere in the world with, ready for this, people who look like me. I want to and I can today connect with people who look like me. That can be really, really good, and it can be really, really bad. So we, we look at these slides and we kind of ponder them and, and we form impressions. We all walk in here with impressions and, and from yesterday, the, the briefings and today and tomorrow, you know, we, we were trying to shape our thinking on all this kind of stuff. And we walk away with some impressions. So let's talk about these. These are just some of the four impressions I throw out there. Impressions I have on this digital age that's emerging and what it's doing to us. The first one's a no-brainer, right? Pervasive information environment. What does that mean? I mean, it drives me nuts, man. I ask my I have three daughters. They're all active duty. A couple of them aren't active anymore. But you ask them to go somewhere, and they, you know, I'm old school, right? Show me the map. I know where I am. They, they do the phone. Information comes from the phone. What happens if the phone doesn't work? Well, I can't go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but, but this concept of information flowing everywhere, and, and think of that refresh gap, it certainly drives us to a change culture. And, and this is something for this symposium, all the people in here, that next bullet, the reality of interdependence. I, I, I'm gonna talk more about this in, in partnership, but the reality that you are inter, you, let's see, let's, the general Titan's right there. You are interdependent, Bill Benner, you are interdependent with, we're gonna look at it later, with the rest of the globe, whether you like it or not. What does that mean? Third bullet. Digital age, it's here, right? The internet of things. Thank you, you got it. Put an X in the square. Where's your thinking? Are you using the right tactics and strategy? I said tactics, maybe I should have said strategy. And, and then we go through this, are we, are we depending on the right tactics? Ask Sony, that was a no-brainer, right? Wow. Does that do anything to us? Yeah. I, the, the fourth bullet down, though, is kind of an interesting one. I'll get some pushback on that. Ask the residents of Ferguson, Missouri. See, here's, here's the, our thinking on this. We had an incident happen somewhere in the world. And there are facts associated with that. Then we had an emergent behavior of a culture and a population base that some might argue had almost nothing to do with, ready, with the facts on the ground. Who drove that behavior? Who made the decision? And then write that down, decision. Because we're going to talk about decision making later, but somebody drove that. People made decisions to riot, to commit violence, to destroy a city, a portion of a city. Those were Americans. 
And the answer to the question of who made the decision is the person that they were listening to. Wow. Juxtapose that thinking on your problem set. See, bottom bullet. The digital age must, should be, cause us to think different. That, that's so hard. So critical thinking, strategic thinking, one of my big areas. But this is such a difficult thing because we were raised in an industrial age with industrial age processes, with a Napoleonic staffing in the military. Go read up the, on those words. You can Google it. Uh, but that influences us, particularly people in this crowd. That's why I did the generational thing, because you all are boomers and Gen X, and there's a, there's a pretty big divide on the millennials on how they think. But your organizations, the collective body of your thinking and your organizations is not digital age thinking. That's a problem. So take that thing and now I want to go into, you know, uh, what this enterprise thinking and, and how we approach the problem from the, I'm, I'm, and I'm came bringing this to you as sort of the operational perspective. For four years I ran the Global Mobility Enterprise versus 18th Air Force Commander, then as AMC commander, Vice Commander, uh, was involved day to day. What this means to you is this map right here is a map of the enterprise. Uh, the, all these nodes, there's airplanes going in and out all, at least once a week, almost every day in many cases. Remember, every 90 seconds, or today it's two minutes, there's an airplane taking off somewhere in the world in the global air mobility enterprise. So it looks like this. And we look at every one of those nodes as real nodes, and you look at all the different places, including down in the South Pole, that's a big enterprise. So we look at that and we think, well, you know, what? how do I think through this from the, now the digital age, the cyber perspective, just take that piece, but I'll look at how we break this down. And, and we look at that, and as strategists in the military, we want to break this down. I got to, that's my battle space right there. I got to own that battle space. I got to figure out how do I defend that battle space. And so I take this thing, and, and first off, I want to point out that's, that may be the mobile, global uh, air mobility enterprise, but it looks a lot like your enterprise. Because today, particularly if you're in this room, your enterprise is really huge, right? And, and so many of us are global one way or another. And you can read those questions down there. They're meant to sort of generate the question, what do you know about your enterprise? So what we did is you take every one of these nodes and you say, well, I gotta defend this thing. I gotta, I gotta figure out some kind of defense structure, including cyber. And so we break it down. You know, we, we take this and every one of those dots, every single one of them. By the way, this enterprise, check this out. When I was 18th Air Force Commander, 53,000 people, active duty. You aggregate that at AMC and this enterprise, just the air piece, right? 133,000 active reserve guard civilians, and there are some contractors too. And all of those dots, uh, you know, on any given day, there's at least 137 dots, uh, but, but in contingencies, it goes way up beyond that. So let's think of 133,000 people. You have all of them connected through, in Transcom, there's 67 different systems. And Transcom, air mobility is a little bit different, but they're all they're connected to them one way or another. So think of that problem set. And so we're one compromise, 133,000 people. All those computers, all those different, and this is just the cyber problem set. One compromise, and without getting into specifics, <laughs> we know some of this, right? One person, way off in the middle of nowhere, middle of the ocean. All you gotta do is get one back door, right? Wow. No problem. So we break this down. We look at this and say there's airmen, there's airplanes, there's infrastructure. Well, I'll make it easy for you. We just, we, we really did go through this analysis, you know, and B uh, was a big part of this, where you just say, okay, let's break it down to the people. Let's look at the infrastructure. Let's look at the equipment. And of course, it's all bundled together with command and control. And that's our enterprise. And we look at the different, different uh, threat working groups and all this. Everybody looks at their perspectives and puts the emergent threat and how do we orient on the threat because we got to get the stuff to the fight if you're in the air mobility business, or you gotta get the fuel to the fight. You know, it doesn't do very good if the president picks up the phone, says, launch the fleet, and you say, whoops, sorry about that. Um, my airplanes can't get there. So we, we have to comprehend this. And, and we understand that we have mission partners associated with us, so we put them in there too, and we pull it all together, and we say, hey, look, here's a reasonable goal from an information pr perspective, and only information. We have to re have a good enough understanding of the threat in the system to 
deliver the right knowledge, the right place, the right time to make the right decision. That's basically what that says. Fuse knowledge at the decision point. We have to protect that process. Seems pretty simple, right? So we want to understand this. We have contractors that help us uh, to some degree, and we, we figure we got our hands around this, and we own our battle space. That's military strategic thinking and application. And then we, we go to each of these dots, and we figure it out, and we got the problem solved, and we write all kinds of rules. You will comply with these rules. And, and we say, there, you know, that's good. We've done it. People will comply. One of our problems is, though, the enterprise doesn't really look like this. It looks like this. Because I have my designated systems and all that, but everybody knows, right? You don't just follow those rule sets. You also, you know, chat on this, send an email there, pick up a phone, see a buddy, talk her in the halls and all this kind of stuff. And so it's really much more complex as I try to wrap my hands around the, the uh, enterprise. You still with me? Um, Bill, is that still making sense? You still tracking? Okay, thanks. My other anchor. The problem is it doesn't look like this either. It looks like this. Well, let it sink in a little bit. You see, your enterprise is connected on the right side. All those charts, that global, remember that global digital perspective? Whether you like it or not, you're plugged in. I'll give you one example. It's real tactical, and it just frustrates the heck out of us, but this is a, a commander-level thing, and it's really kind of interesting. We had a suicide at a base. Of course, you want to clamp that down. You want to find out that the person's really dead. You want to make sure that you, you know, take care of the scene. You want to do all these things, make sure the family's informed right, follow the rules, rules, compliance that the Air Force has. Man, we, we have a process that, that is designed to protect everybody. Uh, and it, it's a good process. It's such a tragedy when that kind of thing happens. And we really, really work through those uh, and, and really a lot of concern. Problem was in this one place, within seconds, Facebook pages opened up and all kinds of data was going down. And that was our enterprise. We're supposed to protect this information. We're supposed to protect that scene, that situation. My argument is that's connected to your enterprise. Wow, what does that mean? Blue dots up there, just as important. They're purposely unmarked because you have, we identified what we call enterprise mission partners, but you have partners or people who should be partners that are out there that are being impacted and that impact you, your mission set. And you hear that, I hear this a lot, by the way, on the floor and the symposium, it's really interesting. Good Americans that want to be part of the solution set, good Americans that can see we can make it faster, cheaper, better, or we can help you defend this, or we can be part of this digital enterprise, but they, for a variety of reasons, they can't get there from here. The problem is they're part of your enterprise, <laughs> okay? 80%, the number I heard last week, 80% of all the systems are outside the government. Hmm. Who owns this problem? Who, who owns this problem? This is tough. Well, now when I look at this perspective, and I, you know, I'm, I'm a knuckle dragger, but I start looking at this perspective and I think to myself, wow. I begin to be able to wrap my hands around or my brain around this perspective of my enterprise and my environment is much bigger than I thought. I'm connected to places I don't know and I'm not connected to places I probably should be. And somehow, if I'm trying to win the fight of 10 years, five years, whatever you, number you want to put on it, I've got to get my hands around this, my brain around this. And I have to know that I'm thinking different, that I'm not using the tactics of the old days. Uh, so as a leader, if we own this problem, you know, as we go around, we talk to a lot of different companies now and, and kind of have a fun an entrepreneurial consulting that gives you a license to go to defense, to commercial, to bring them together, to go to security firms, engineering firms, power firms, get a lot of different organizations. It's kind of a fun thing. And uh, we begin to see some things that are consistent when it comes to leadership in this kind of environment. There are certain questions leaders should be able to answer, we believe. So if you think you're a leader in this digital age environment, you might think about these. These are deliberately thought-provoking. Do you know what this is really about? 
we write this question down because I'm, I'm concerned about this concept that I, the joint warfighter, who's really good people, they're really good people, they really are, and some of them are, really do get it. But collectively, I'm not sure we really do. Purple on the left, I alluded to this earlier, but who are the real decision makers? Remember the Ferguson thing. In the digital age, this is funny because the military, this, this tickles us a little bit, right? We want to be in control. We're going to do this because I said so. You know, I'm the decision maker, centralized command, decentralized execution, blah, 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 blah. People make decisions at the contact point, and they do it with the, their perception of the commander's intent, the values of the institution, who's pointing the gun at me, those kinds of things. That's been true on the battlefield for ancient, but it is also true in our global environment today. The impact of the digital age is that decision-making is being, whether we like it or not, is being decentralized one way or another. And, and, and so for us, it's, wow, what do we do about that? What does that mean to us? How do we think through that problem set? Listening. The cool thing about the digital age is we have the capability to listen in ways we've never been able to listen before. Okay? We can listen to machines in ways we couldn't listen before. I can have machines listen to machines around the world in ways I never was able to before. I can actually listen to human beings. Okay? This is now, this is for, since we have this crowd, here's one for you that you might expect this, but for millennials when they see this and they get to that point right there, they said, yeah, but the leadership doesn't listen. Kind of stings a little bit. I don't even know what that means, but, but you ought to know. What does listening tell you? Where are your pickets in this digital age? And what is listening telling you? And what does it mean? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about knowledge artists and thought leaders, but, but you all know that. And I, I think they have a real role uh, in this. Partnerships. This is partner day, so my perspective, please. Uh, I get concerned, and that's too strong a word, and that's the negative. Let me say it this way. Uh, we have to have a better understanding of what partners mean in this age. A partner, the President of the United States is not my partner in this, this discussion. He's the recipient of a service that I'm providing, I'm obligated, he's the user. I, don't, I know there's a type of partnership there, but he's not really my partner. If I'm trying to provide communication to the President of the United States, then what do I want? <laughs> May sting a little bit, but you know, the, the uh, remember one of the slides when I was a uh, active duty and said, Hey, you know, good news, we have 99% reliability on the communications. So that's really good. What happened to the 1%? Well, we're not sure. Go find out. Because if that 1% was the one time the president tried to make a phone call, then we're not at 99%, we're at 0%. I promise you. Been there, done that, got that t shirt. So who's the partner in that equation? Well, partner, it was, in my case, you know, because we were at Air Mobility, you know, Air, we had the obligation to make sure Air Force One was at 100%. Partners are the people that are providing that service. With me, we have a common interest to advance that. In, the, in this digital age, who are your partners? Well, I mean, the floor is full of them, right? Some of you want, or want to be partners. But, but how are we capitalizing on our partnerships? What solution sets are out there that we don't even see because we allow ourselves to, to, well, I'm comfortable with the fences I put up in my battle space. And, and boy, if there's one thing in the 18 months since I graduated, I, I see this in spades to you in uniform. I, I wish I could just rip off this, and I know there's, there's laws and all that kind of stuff that we have to look at, but this is a issue, frankly, Bob Allardyce opinion, I could be wrong, although I am a strategic thinker and a strategist. Uh, this is what's gonna kill us. Missing the partnerships, that's my opinion. How are we capitalizing on them? Do we have the right ones? By the way, I, I, not to let the commercial sector off the hook, I mean the right ones. What's the standard? You know, what's the speed I think that we ought to be able to communicate? I don't care if I've had you on contract for 20 years. There's a standard, you can't do it. Can somebody else? Yes, give them the contract. Are we writing the right standards and demanding the performance? Because what's cool about America, and we all can wave the flag at this, is that we solve those kind of problems. And the commercial sector is wonderful. And, and, and here's another thing you might look at. 
uh, outside objective observers to help you discover where your partnerships are. Outside objective observers. And I'm not talking, you know, consult, I do consulting, but somebody who can look, like when I go into the military organization today, I'm wearing a hat as a senior mentor or something like that. I'm an outside objective observer. I have some expertise, but I don't, you know, I'm there to look at it and see the seams. And what's fascinating to me is how quickly a good outside objective observer can say, look, there's four seams here. Or there's somebody over there that has that capability, and you didn't even know about that. That's what partners can do. And then I, I threw that last orange bullet in there uh, for the uh, champion, the millennial cause here, the refresh gap. Man, that is so big. Because here's what happens. I, I can't tell you how many times, and I, I got to be careful how I say this, not to get people in trouble. Some, a captain will come up to me, particularly now that I'm wearing the invisible uniform, and, and they'll say, hey, guess why I did this, this, and this. And, and let me translate what, what they did. They found a way to get around the network. You know, they have data that's inside the wire. They want to do homework at home. And you, you in this game of cat and mouse and compliance, you write all these rules, say you can't do this, can't do that, can't do that. And we had that conversation, by the way. Whenever I, somebody tells me this, say, you, you realize that the whole thing here is you're an officer and you're supposed to <laughs> you know, help the system. But, but it's almost a badge of honor with them. You, you get my point on the refresh gap. The point is they know they can do all this stuff at home and they know that they have a fence over here. And, and I'm just being really straight with you all and senior leaders they blow right by it. And, and they're really good at it. I, <laughs> I laugh, but I'm not, you know I'm not laughing. It's one of those, wow. You know you're not supposed to do that, right? <laughs> you're gonna be a major, you're, you're a captain, you're, wow, yeah. I almost said next slide, almost. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so what does this bring us to? The digital age paradox, sorry I missed the transition. This is the paradox. This is gonna, I hope this drives you nuts. There's a lot of paradox in the digital age. Are you ready for this? If you want to main control, maintain control, give it up. The digital age is forcing us to shift our thinking. My hypothesis and working theory is that the bad guys are doing this shifting, and if we don't, then we, we carry the coconuts and they get the reward of the bow and arrow. Shift in thinking comes a lot of ways. You may have your own way of saying this, but, but study that. I know you're studying. I can see some of you shaking your heads, some of you either way. But look at some of these things. Number one, I'll point out. I'm not going to go through every one of these. Number one, a shift in thinking on the objective from because I said so to because we made it so. Leadership today, man, it's so important that you clearly communicate. This is, we see this a lot in the joint environment and everywhere. That you clearly communicate the mission, the intent, your values, that you shape the environment so that your decision makers, your real decision makers, have the tools and the knowledge to make the right decision at the right place at the right time. It's my belief, it's your obligation to ensure that the systems can deliver the right information, the right place, right time. But the right knowledge, information, you know, data, information, knowledge, that progression, the right knowledge doesn't do any good if that person doesn't have the right perspective. Understand the commander's intent, understand mission type orders, understand what decision they're supposed to make. That's what that means right there. Giving up control, by the way, I don't mean just let walk away. I mean understanding how, where your enterprise is and how you shape the battle space. That's about the fifth bullet down, control. Shape the emergent behavior of the organization. Your assessments, your assessments in this age cannot be compliance. I drive you nuts. Oh, hey, we're 100% compliance. So what? You say that today. You know, if you're compliant oriented, you're not secure. If you're secure oriented, you might, you probably will comply, and and, and you get the difference. Our, you know, I love, I bleed blue and purple. But our bureaucracy is compliance oriented. It's easy to be that way. It's not going to work. No, and I should rephrase. It's not working. You can read all of these. Partnership. Uh, my real point there is I, I, because of that 80-20 thing, this is we won't survive alone. We have to partner with the right people. And then the bottom bullet, uh, we'll spend some time on this. In the digital age, with, with people we work with, with small security firms and even at the higher levels, what we are finding is this shift in thinking is from from the internal external lines, you know, internal lines. I have it, my door is locked, all of the windows are closed, I have a gate, 
Everything's secure, everything in here is internal. Militarily, that's how we were kind of raised as young people campaigning, internal lines, external lines. And if you're on external lines, you gotta find a way to protect the convoy. Internal, external lines, that's the way we think of security. We know in this room that's gone. Security is being redefined by the bad guys as much as anybody, but it is being redefined. And you do still have to do the three-dimensional physical security stuff, and you have to have the persistent 3D plus persistent preservation of the data and persistent time. What does time mean? Well, because of the speed of everything, obviously. You know, you can somebody go bankrupt that fast, right? Self-healing system, all that might prevent it, but 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 that has to be part of the equation. Your assessments have to look at 5D persistent, and I mean persistent. Your systems have to be at the point where all the things you know that they mean. Are you guys smarter than I am? But but this is I say a shift in thinking because this is really a footstomp point. The the joint warfighter where my domain is doesn't. I mean they 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 say those words and yeah okay yeah yeah that's great. But my observation is they don't comprehend it for the for the almost said digital age. I don't think that the collective we have a real good way to present it. And I absolutely don't think that our systems are there. I want to say one other thing here, and this is a little bit out of school. Not attributed, but I have heard this from multiple commercial companies. I'm about ready to give up on Department of Defense. They can't move fast enough, they're gonna lose the battle. I'm, I'm restructuring my strategy so that I can win the digital fight myself and protect my company, my assets. If they come to me, I'm willing to help them, but I'm not gonna move at their speed because it creates too much risk. I've heard those words, or I paraphrase, but that's the essence of it. Really, to me, uh, eye-opening. Digital age paradox. I hope that you ask me questions on this. We have a little bit of time for Q&A here in a few minutes, and, and you may follow up on some of these things. So, two more slides. Questions for the symposium. I wish there were more Gen Zers in here and more of millennials. This is all, this whole thing is to get you to think differently, to consider things, to ponder what the problem set is. Who owns this problem? And as you go through the symposium, I hope you ask these kinds of questions of yourself. And I hope you ask these kinds of questions of the people on the stage or the panels. Enterprise. I beat that one to death. Digital gaps. If, if you're in the military environment, and, and uh, you know, I, I listen to the, some of the presenters and some of the things they say, and, and I have to tell you, to me, that's just a tick mark. There's a digital gap right there. That person thinks this, I know that's a gap. They're creating a gap because they're, they're separating people and they don't even know they're separate. And this is because we're stovepipe and we're functional. I mean, it drove me nuts in the air mobility business that <laughs> this, this enterprise over here, part, part of the enterprise, set up a structure that did everything for them and had nothing to do with these people over here, and they built this huge wall between them. I, I kind of like the third bullet. And then knowledge artists. I I'm, have observed that organizations that are not just emerging but are thriving right now uh, have culture and individuals in the culture that are truly entrepreneurial or they have access to entrepreneurs. If you don't have them in your organization, for heaven's sakes, go get one. You know? Go get an outside objective observer, but find somebody who can really think entrepreneurially, which is a lot different than what the military structure really advances, quite frankly. You know, true innovation. And, and this thing about entrepreneuring and the, the knowledge artist. To me, this is the really cool work in the digital age, because these are the people who are sitting back and are watching what the emergent behavior of the organization is and are coming up with the battle plans that allow you to understand how to shape the knowledge in your organization. This, you know, this is where we spend a lot of time. And how do you manage the purity of content so that you have the right knowledge at the right place at the right time? And this is not KM knowledge management, uh, which is often kicked over into the side again as, as uh, admin queeb stuff. In the digital, now I'm gonna go over, and information age, 
and information is everything. But it, only if it can be there and it can be right, actionable knowledge. So, closing thoughts. Who owns this problem? We do. But do we really? Do, do we think of it as a we? Do we think of it as a, my battle space? And as long as it's outside my gate, I don't have to worry about it. And you'd never admit that, but do you think that way? Believe passionately that first bullet. I think if we don't get that right, there's a really good chance we're going to have a hard time in the next big fight. Second bullet, take it to the bank. I already talked about the third bullet. And then you should ask me a question about the last one. There's a real story behind that. But a lot of what we talked about today, you know, the, the theme of the day is partnership. And I suspect that, and, and I don't just suspect I'm guilty of, uh, trying to be a innovator in the mobility business and trying to push out the enterprise and comprehend the enterprise and, and uh, push out decision making with all of that. I think I may have taken no, sometimes unintentionally, from people who didn't have the authority to say yes. Ask me about that later. Who owns this problem? We do. Are you going to be somebody who figures out this? Or are you going to be satisfied with this? Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question for General Allardyce, if you would just please stand uh, where you are and we will bring a microphone to you so you can be heard. Anyone want to start questions? There's one up front here, please. I'm going to go down here. Sir, Pete Sove from uh, U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, in years past, we've heard uh, the buzz phrase, digital D Pearl Harbor, needed to get have that happen to really get that change in thinking. Haven't heard it at the conference, but I have heard a lot about Sony. Uh, and looking at the 16 critical sectors that uh, have been defined for the U.S., entertainment certainly isn't one of them. But we don't hear a lot about the Wells Fargo, Chase, Target, Home Depot so much. What's it gonna take to get that change of thinking across uh, society, not only in the US, but globally? Bold, decisive leadership. And I don't see a lot of it. I can say that now. Shooting straight. I, you know, who knows? But things like Ferguson are really, really important because yeah, that happened in our country. And things like the Sony and the Wells Fargo, that, that's happening. And I, the thing that's fascinating is, that's why I use these. I, I hope you go, you know, read the history. It's really fascinating. I, you, know, you, you see these, these powers that are just invincible, and they get creamed. History is littered with battle, history's battlefields, with, with the greatest army getting wiped out by some little, you know, long-haired pony rider. Mongols. Uh, and so I, I don't, I choose not to believe we got to go through another Pearl Harbor. I choose not to believe that. That's, I, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm, for heaven's sakes, I'm a war fighter still. But, but I understand if you don't comprehend and balance this. By the way, this is one of the risks in, in this environment. Why do I do this kind of presentation? Because you're all so smart. You're trying to solve the digital uh, fight. But what I keep saying, you know, the, the warfighter, joint warfighter doesn't get it because it doesn't matter if you get it. 
Real bullets fly. Real people get blown up. We're in the profession of arms, and we kill people and try to avoid being killed. And we have to blend that with this fight. It's not an either or. It's how do we move this to the next level? And the bad guys are doing it. Almost every day I turn, because I was the building unit, but I got to be the, was honored to be the strategist at CINCOM during the Dempsey Dave Petraeus days. Well, if you don't think that was fun, I wasn't really the strategist, I was the deputy strategist, right? <laughs> for, for guys like Dave Petraeus. But this, to have gone through that and to been in that part of the, the battle and to see things and to see where we are today and to see what's going on behind the scenes in some of these places, it just, it, it, it's troubling. And I'm talking about this fight in particular, information fight and the way they're leveraging digital to, to what I think is just win the fight almost every corner. So I don't, what's it gonna take? It, it, okay, so I'll say it now. Never take a no from somebody who doesn't have the power to say yes, authority to say yes. So here's my personal story. True story, I was working for Dave Petraeus. I was in Iraq. I briefed him one day and said, he said, uh, okay, Bob, uh, let's go do this thing right here. It was procure something. And I said, well, <laughs> sorry, I'd love to do that, but I don't think we can. Why not? Don't have the authority. Okay. Whose authority does it take? President. And, and in my negative thinking, well, that's... No brainer, not gonna happen. This is really cool, great lesson. Write for me today the email to send to the Secretary of Defense, to send to the President to get that authority. And I did, and he did. I'm like, day and a half, two days later, we had it. See, I had accepted no. Shame on me. And shame on you for accepting no from the laws. Change them. You're not gonna change them you know, by yourself. But, but we're smart enough, we're good enough, and if we can't get the authority today, well, then for heaven's sakes, let's figure out how to work the right system to get the authorities to go do this. And in this particular fight, that's what it's gonna take for us to win this war, to develop the right authorities for the digital age fight. And, and God bless America, 99% of the people don't get this. You get it. If you don't try to find a way to change it, it is not gonna change, so figure it out. Did I answer your question? Thanks, great question, that was fun. Yeah. Hey, I can get excited on this stuff. Uh, sir, sir, is, and then, ma'am, you are, wait, are, were you on my table yesterday? No, okay, lunchtime. Who's the lady that was on my lunch table yesterday? I told her, she said she knew Monty Python, so. Yes. Hey, sir, over here. Oh, okay. Kevin Thompson with CenturyLink. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation today. Would you mind just quickly recapping your concept of the refresh gap? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, these guys over here are geniuses, okay? Uh, they do all kinds of cool things. You know, they Google everything and they can reprogram your whole home uh, in their sleep, left-handed. And then they come to work in the United States Air Force or in Organization X, and we dumb them down. Well, you can't use this, you can't use that, you can't use laptops, you can't use Wi-Fi, you can't do this. I mean, it's, it's a lot of no's, a lot of can'ts. That causes an incredible tension with particularly the millennial generation. It does with me too, by the way. And, and so the, co the consequences are, and true stories, right? We, we've gotten away from this a little bit, but not too long ago, something bad happens, okay, I say we're shutting down the server, shutting down email. You guys can't use it. What a joke. Every one of them, just about, walks outside the gate, gets on the AOL account and says, okay, the idiots shut it down again. That's one, another one, uh, we were moving something somewhere in the world that was sensitive stuff. I got a call from a person who said, that thing is gonna be at this place at this time. How'd you know that? I mean, this is sensitive stuff. Nobody's supposed to know that. Oh, well, when that pilot got on the airplane, that pilot texted me. You get it? The digital world, those numbers I put up there, that's how everybody's communicating. And we're running in and saying, oh, well, you can't do that, can't do that. We gotta do it this way. These are our rules, comply with them. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> we gotta be smarter. We gotta you know, go back to the World War II 
Uh, metaphor, if I can do this with you, and I see some, so I'll go real fast. But think of World War II, remember the convoys? This generation will get it, right? The convoys where you had stuff in the United States, England was sinking, you had to get the stuff to England, and, and you had these U-boats and wolf packs and all that stuff that were gonna kill this. They set off the coast of the United States, they got into our harbors, and we had to figure out this problem set. And so what do we do? We put out sensors and other things to do things like look at periscopes. We tried to break the, enig uh, yeah, the Enigma system. Uh, we did all kinds of things to figure out a way to get the stuff to the fight in that new environment. We didn't make up a lot of crazy rules. Thank you. Before you give me the hook, I need 30 seconds. So give me a 30 second warning. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Randy Mathis, Air Force Base Command Cyber Requirements. So to sort of address at least a part of the refresh gap, we have don't have the agility in our sustainment or, or what I would call sustainable agility because in order to move fast enough to support the systems we can't necessarily afford that oh so yeah great one how, Thank you. how how do we begin to address yeah what this, I would call sustainable agility yeah yeah this is gonna be a really hard answer for you but uh, innovative solutions real innovative solutions and they're out there so so here's this is the I could throw these kind of darts right some people get mad but uh, we continue to pay billions of dollars for solutions that are out there that are $100 million. It's, you ready for this big word? Stupid. And, and we giggle about that and we say, yeah, but then we say, I can't do anything about it. That's what the last bullet's about. For heaven's sakes, change it. That's where the commercial sector is leaving us behind. They get it. And I mean, they really get it. The Sony thing, listen, uh, part of what I do, you know, corporate board stuff and try to be smart on corporate boards, Really interesting to see in the corporate room now how you know they, they basically, my words, a couple years ago were taking risk. That's eh, a $10 million thing. We won't put any money into this because we can absorb a 10 million. And what they're finding out, that's not 10 million, that's a billion dollar risk. And so now all of a sudden, you all are getting phone calls, right? And the corporate board is saying, hey, can you come do an audit on me? Can you help me figure out this problem set? And they're gonna fix this. The commercial world will fix it. And we'll be still looking at the fence that we built. Did I answer that question respectfully enough? Okay. Yes, next. Well, sir, I want to circle back to your um, comment about not taking no. Back in 2000, I was at the Air Force Institute of Technology as an instructor. It's actually with the systems and logistics, but I'm actually an engineer. So I knew a lot of people in engineering school. I was also looking at the fact that, you know, if things were starting to go online, we have a lot of young officers that couldn't get released from their assignments to go to school. So I was like, we need to get the school to them. But when I talked to the engineering professors, their comment was always, oh, you can't teach what I teach online. Yeah. So the question I tell, I tell them, that's not the question, is whether you can do it or not. The question is how yeah. do you do it? Sure. That was a speech, right? Did you, did you have a question? No, because I agree with you. That, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but entrepreneurial innovation is just, I mean, it's fun, it's cool, I'm out, out here now, and I, I love going somewhere and, and having people have impossible solutions. I mean, for, for folks like us, that's oh, good, give me that one, impossible, I love that word impossible, because I don't believe it. You know, we can find the solution, there are things that are really hard, and then it gets into, do you wanna pay the cost? Uh, and, and so, uh, we don't need, we, we need balance, so don't get me wrong here, but we don't need more people to say no. That's why I came up with that saying. It's a really good saying, by the way. By the way, the way this works, and, and I use this first time I really use it a lot was after I was taught the lesson. But when I was in Iraq, you know, somebody would say, we talking about a weapon system, blah, 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 no, 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 no. And then we basically would say, I understand you don't have the authority to say yes. Who in your chain of command has the authority to say yes? And, and over half the time, I got to the answer. Because they just, you know, we're spring-loaded for knowing bureaucracies. Don't accept it, and you're accepting it. Next. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Gibson, 22nd Space Operations Squadron. Over here, sir, to your right. Oh. Hello, sir, how are you doing today? Living the dream. No doubt. Sir, thanks for your leadership and your service, first of all, but uh, what I'd like to bring up today is as a commander's military leader. Cyber. Yes, sir. Um, we like to think that we can get everybody on board with a common mission, common vision. Good to see you again. Yes, sir, good seeing you too. Um, 
But one of the challenges we face today is we move away from dedicated mission systems for our missions to yes. an enterprise solution. How do we get disparate stakeholders with diverging goals on board with agreeing to the common problem set that we all share on that enterprise? And how do we work to a common solution? Great question. And so you have to, this is part of the, the thought of give up control. Uh, you, and you can do this. And those who are disciples at Air Mobility Command may argue that I got to do some of this, had the privilege of doing this. Uh, you open up. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, by the way, if you want to ask me to come look at your organization and help you do this, I'd be very happy to do it for a very small fee. There's my commercial. This is a million dollar question. You can do this. You have to open up your organization. You got to look for the right tools. Remember what I said about as a leader, you have to be accessible. True accessibility, you have to communicate your intent persistently, your values persistently. You have to push decision making out and you have to expose your decision making to the entire enterprise. Man, that is tough. It takes a lot of guts, and I can't tell you how many times I had to confess my sins and how stupid I was in front of thousands of people. But it worked, right? You were there, you saw. Very doable. Ask me this question, grab me in the next couple of days, and I can talk to you about your organization. That's a, that's a million dollar, billion dollar question. It is doable. The problem inside the Department of Defense is that most of our leaders are conservators. They, they, it's so hard for them to open up. They're going to get their clock cleaned. OK, that's the question. Sir, you have time for one more question. One more question, and then I have a closing comment. I went this way, so you wouldn't have to listen to the squeal again. Who's Morning, next? sir. Michael Stachesko, Peterson Comm Squadron. Hi. Uh, my, my first question for you real quick was uh, your quote, never take no from a person who doesn't have the authority to say yes. Um, I, I really like that. Uh, do I attribute to that to you if I use that, or do you get that from somewhere else? Um, you, you, the second portion. Thank you of for asking thing. the question. You can attribute that to me. There's a, <laughs> several up there that were copyrighted, if you didn't notice. Roger, sir. The second portion of my question was uh, you're talking about the refresh gap. It's more geared towards people. Um, what are your thoughts on equipment? Um, an example I can give you when the power company was talking about using uh, smart meters, I, I know there was a discussion about using that information to determine yeah. whether you were on vacation, yeah. you know, and yeah. bad people using that to do bad things. How, how do you feel about, you know, what are your thoughts on the equipment? In yeah, that no, regard? good question. And so uh, I'm, um, if you really want to dig down and, and have a real com fun conversation, have a lot of influence on complexity theory, naturalistic decision making. And I, I, so that leads us to complex adaptive systems. I think that we're talking about complex adaptive systems. You have to design your system that way. Sorry to get so geeky. And that the, the point here is that you're trying to study the emergent behavior of the complex adaptive system, which may be a human system, a machine system, and or a combination system. But, but this is what the organizations that are excelling today are doing. Great question. Really good. Most people didn't get it. Um, am I done? OK, so I first off want to uh, acknowledge the warriors of the future. And, and uh, I really think it's cool what the Air Force Academy does. I, I, I uh, appreciated it. Well, probably not as much back then. But Josh, where, where'd you go? Go ahead and where'd you go? There he is. So uh, since he allowed me to embarrass him on stage, I want him to take uh, the bow and arrow set. You can say it's a Mongol set if you want to. I, I don't know where it came from. And you can probably guess where these two are going. I have no choice. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. If the two of you get together, you can make the sound. Thank you for your attention. Really been fun. Hang on. Uh, Sir, on behalf of the Rocky Mountain chapter of AFSIA, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your uh, patience, and we thank you for all of your knowledge and your presentation today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Really good. Thanks. Hope to see you around campus. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to our morning break sponsored by Gartner. So please stretch your legs throughout the Microsoft exhibit hall and maybe stop by the espresso bar. And uh, that's sponsored by Harris. Thanks very much. We'll reconvene at 10.15 for our first panel. <laughs>